My name is Alex Colas. I teach international politics here at Birkbeck. And it gives me immense pleasure and a sense of trepidation and anticipation to welcome uh, David Harvey and Andy Merrifield. The immediate uh, reason behind it is the publication of two new books by Andy and David. Um, Andy Merrifield's The New Urban Question, just published by, by Peter Press, and, and David Harvey's um, 17 Contradictions and the End of Capitalism. I hope that the tenor of, um, of this evening's proceedings is going to be precisely around the, the conversation. A conversation that I think is especially important in a city like ours, uh, that is witnessing maybe not unprecedented, but certainly an intensification of social cleansing to the benefit of global capital. It seems to me that that kind of uh, fetishism of the aesthetics of this social cleansing is one of the things that perhaps we'll be discussing, because as uh, David in his other books has suggested, uh, the right to the city, and I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, requires, is, um, is predicated on a radical transformation of social relations, not just architectural forms and uh, aesthetics, but uh, the real transformation of power relations within our city. And we've got um, two speakers that I don't think need further introduction, who've um, given us plenty of food for thought about how to think about those social transformations, um, about their contradictions and about their potential, um, and also, of course, think about the, the forms. I'm, I'm not, for a minute, uh, wishing to this the, the, the fact that the built environment has a form and that needs transforming as well. When I was conceiving the new urban question, uh, I, I guess I had an idea that I didn't want it to make, make it a brick. You know, in the 1960s, people were talking about books are being dialectics of, of the, the brick. You know, the, the book was a brick, and you could talk about books breaking windows and being a dialectics of the brick and a dialectics of books, so it was some, some brick-like thing that could do some serious damage. I suppose I had in mind a little bit of a dynamite charge. So my, my book was conceived maybe as an intervention into certain debates around, around a thought about the city, about urban studies in particular. And my last book, uh, which is called The Politics of Encounter, engaged with the right of the city. And I was quite mindful of that. There were, there were lots of, I had lots of abuse and lots of uh, raised eyebrows when I sort of announced that I didn't think the right to the city was the right, left, progressive, clarion call. So I felt obliged to maybe qualify it. And then when I started to qualify, I, I realized I, I had a lot more I wanted to say. And in, in some ways, I wanted to address it at a, at a slightly different audience, a slightly different target even, too. And the target I had, in, I had in mind, I suppose, was was twofold. So it was an intervention. It was an intervention. It was a, a little dynamite charge that was trying to detonate. And I think that, that's a word that Henri Lefebvre uses often: the notion of detonation. His interventions detonate a certain kind of, of, of mode of thought, a certain complacency around what is being said, what is being written, what is being boomed out on the media. About, about cities, cities, global cities, cities around the world. And that also has its, of course, it has its spokespeople who uh, beam that, that, that message out. And so I, was, I had in mind that I wanted to detonate, intervene, a group of, a body of thought that on the one hand could be described as professionalization, the professionals, the professional urbanists, the people, the specialists, the, the UN Habitat, the, the World Urban Forum, this, the kind of, the, the, the urban equivalent of Davos. Uh, these guys meet, they meet, uh, they met in Naples last year and they met in, uh, in Rio in 2010. This coming year, next week, in fact, is in Medellin in, in Colombia. And they, they, they talk about, about global urban problems about resolving the global poverty tra uh, trap. They tend to be talking in a way which is the, the professionals. I always see them as a, or almost a kind of uh, urban equivalent of doctors who wear white coats and they say things, and we believe them. And if you look at the discourse, often the discourse is, is quite slippery because on the one hand, the discourse can be uh, 
couched in, in, a, in a very subtle neo-Malthusianism, whereby one becomes quite apocalyptic about the urban, about big cities, about global cities, about cities getting bigger, about in X number of years there's going to be so many numbers of people, the balance has shifted, we're living in an urban planet, 2030 there's going to be 60% of the globe is going to be urbanized, 2050, 2050 we're going to see 75%, etc., etc. Isn't this really scary, frightening, given that actually a lot of that new urbanization is going to be people living in, 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 in very... Uh, very, very poverty-stricken circumstances. But the Malthusianism suggests that the problem is the city itself, is the, is the urban. So it tends to obfuscate, it tends to somehow mask the class relations, the power relations. And one of the things you notice about the professionals is that they tend to be always addressing the poor, the policies addressed to the poor. They never actually attack the rich. And I think that's quite significant, and it's a point that actually I just noticed this morning that David makes in, in, his, in his new book too, that the, the, the professionals tend to target a certain kind of, of action addressed to the poor. They do it in quite subtle ways. It, it would be easy to dismiss it as just this top-downism, but it doesn't work that way anymore, I don't think. I think that if you look at the professionalization of urban studies and some of the, some of the ways in which they, they, they think about the urban, it, it, it is rather slippery. You now they talk about, yes, we agree with the right to the city, which was a mantra in Rio. We agree about urban equity, which is the new concept note for, for the, the World Urban Forum for next week. So they, they, they also agree with the spatial fix as well, which I noted in, in, in something that they've written, which made me, made me laugh a little bit. Uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a very subtle way in which this top-down professionalization of the urban and urban programs is a, a subtle way of reappropriation. Some of the language, some of the discourse that we would traditionally associate with progressives, people on, on the left. We also see it in universities, and, and this is where the the the, the, the neo-Malthusianism and the professionalisation fits in very nicely with the, the, the post-political, the post-politicisation, if you like, of urban studies in universities, because often. Professionals deal in numbers. It's a numbers game. They often deal with numbers. I know I'm caricaturing, but I'm just setting these targets up just so we can enter the debate. It's a numbers game. Yeah, they, they, they're dealing it often in quantification, in terms of evaluation, because all these programs need to be evaluated. The numbers games and the evaluative uh, programs can also get grants. The grants are good for the university, so they're encouraged. The specialization becomes rather narrow, so urban studies becomes quite a narrow thing. People reproduce the same kind of articles and they, they, get, they, they, they publish them in the journals. They're not saying very much, which is particularly startling. It's not going to upset anybody. And it gets grants, and then we get this system of reproduction. It does begin to talk about something which I, as, as, as somebody from the left, as a Marxist, really doesn't get to, this, to talk about, about the perpetrators, about the question of, of, of a, a, certain systemic, uh, a, a certain systemic analysis about capitalism in general. I'll come back to that in, in a second. If we've got the professionals on the one hand, on the other hand, we have a group of people and, and, and a, a, a discourse, we can call it that, uh, which is professional. Uh, and it is professionalized, but it voices a certain triumphalism about the city. So we have the, we have the professionals on the one side, we have the triumphalists on the other. And here, the triumphalists, I would obviously put in, in, in that category, people like Edward Glazer, Triumph of the City, his book from 2011. And the triumphalists have a, 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 rather, odd, um, a rather odd folk hero for their, for their mode of thinking, and that is Jane Jacobs. Jane Jacobs, not the Jane Jacobs of the death and life of the great American cities, although they have that too, but it's more Jane Jacobs of 1984, Cities and the Wealth of Nations. And the, the argument that triumphalists are, are peddling, essentially, is that cities are places are, that attract the most talented, the most entrepreneurial, the most dynamic, the youngest people, the go-getters, the people who can create a, 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 this arena of, of, of activity, of economic well-being, to the degree, actually, that when they compete with each other, you get this incredibly dynamic situation where, whereby cities become growth engines, growth machines. 
actually vital for the national economy. And they become more important, as it were, in terms of Jane Jacobs's term, than the, 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 nas the nation itself, the, the, the national state. Uh, the cities become the arenas of value production. Cities and the wealth of nations. One could begin then to think, <coughs> is the city of London really a place where we see entrepreneurial people? Yes. Is it really an economy which in somehow is in, in, in a way productive for the, for the national economy? We can actually quite categorically answer that no. I don't think it is. I think it's a drain on the national economy. We could argue about the, the creativity that goes on in, in London with the, with the basic, the basic economic, e the economic activities that are there. We could, we could make the point actually that rather than think about cities as, the wealth, as wealth creators, we could say that it's somehow for the general good. We could argue that cities, in a way, are places where value is extracted, that capital is accumulated in the hands of a few. So the, one of the big uh, points uh, in, the, in the new urban question here is that cities are, and the language I'm using is, is slightly unpalatable, are, are parasitic. They're full of parasitic classes. The, that entrepreneurship, that entrepreneurial activity is often associated with some form of value extraction, not necessarily value production. An awful lot of smart people do get together, do compete, but when, when you think about what they're doing, often the creativity is around certain forms of creative accountancy. Uh, anybody knows now about the power of the big four accountants in the UK, uh, Price Waterhouse, Deloitte, KPMG, the, the kind of impact they have on the economy now in terms of how they are shaping policy, particularly what they're doing with public infrastructure. And the accountants seem to be kings right now. So we have this economy which is creative, but it seems to be creative in a way which is parasitic. The creation is about creating land markets, thinking about rental extraction, thinking about uh, creative ways to catch money off the state thinking about creative ways in which we can think of new apps that can actually create more, more money for particular sectors of the economy. Does that constitute a national wealth? I'm not so sure. I think what we're seeing here is a, is a development of a, of a rentier class, people living off land rents, people living off interest-bearing capital, people living off exchange, buying cheaply or getting things up for no price at all, and then selling them at, at a greater cost. So we're seeing then, arguably, uh, the triumphalism about the city is some way obfuscating the underlying nature of what that economy is and it's parasitic rather than generative, it's extractive rather than productive. So those two, if you like, two mastheads that I particularly uh, dislike, I wanted to intervene in that in a way that I could come out at the other end with something actually quite meaningful rather than just a critique. And I was thinking about how I could enter that debate, enter the debates of the triumphalist and the, and the professionals. And my point of entry was somebody uh, who wrote about cities in the 1970s, Manuel Castells, the, the, the urban question, who himself suggested that cities are not productive engines the importance in capitalism as a social system isn't because they are in some way the arenas of productive activity. Manuel Castells in The Urban Question, which was published in the early 70s in French, and published in English in 1977, suggested actually that cities are important in the survival of capitalism because they are reproductive. They, they in some way uh, house uh, accumulate, have as, 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 as their basic infrastructure public goods, public goods and services which he called items of, of collective consumption. And collective consumption, from one of Castells, were essentially public services, public housing, uh, public, uh, public infrastructure, mass transit, hospitals, schools, etc., etc., which in the 1970s, when he wrote this book, he was su suggesting that they were all items that were essentially unprofitable. They would not be managed, funded by private capital, 
but they were very they were essential for lubricating the basic dynamics of the capitalist system in the post-war period. Of course, here we have the whole demand-led Keynes Keynesian post uh, for this welfare state capitalism. But the 1970s, as it progressed, some strange things happened to those items of collective consumption. They began to undergo, in the late 70s, deregulation. They began, in a way, to be privatized in the 1980s with Margaret Thatcher. Those of you old enough will remember the, the, the winter of discontent, 78, 79, in, in, in the UK, on the back of the global uh, oil crisis in 73. So the, the, the Keynesian uh, post for the, the Keynesian for this welfare state was under fire in the 1970s, the mid 70s, to the degree that many municipalities across the world were in a fiscal crisis. So the fiscal crisis of the state marred that era, where Manuel Castells was suggesting that these items of collective consumption, public goods, were so vital for the perpetuation of capitalism. Margaret Thatcher. What to say about Margaret Thatcher? <laughs> I don't know whether anybody's seen uh, the Pink Panther movies, right? With Inspector Clouseau and Peter Sellers. You know that? Remember when Peter Sellers, the Inspector Clouseau, enters the Inspector Dreyfus's room and Clouseau! And Inspector Dreyfus, Dreyfus starts to twitch, his eyes start to twitch, you know, with kind of nervous tick. I'm a, I'm a little bit like that with Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> start to kind of get twitching. I mean, I feel like I've been, my, my generation, anybody who's in their early 50s, who was in their 20s in the 1980s under the reign of Margaret Thatcher would have been mightily scarred by the Iron Lady, believe me. To the degree, actually, when I think about it, maybe Peter Sellers is Inspector Clouseau isn't the right one. I'll put, you know, more, it, it's maybe Dr. Strangelove. <laughs> Remember that from uh, Dr. Strangler, who also with Peter Sellers. So. Well, Margaret Thatcher, what to say about Margaret Thatcher? <laughs> I'll actually pass on Margaret Thatcher because we want to remember that Margaret Thatcher didn't want to privatise the Royal Mail. <laughs> okay. I think it's good. The, 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 the actual question about, about the new urban question, if I can add the new to it, in, in, uh, in bright yellow, I like, and speech. <laughs> Well, when you, when you actually do that, you really have to say something which is novel then, don't you? Because you're implying this is something new. I probably have to say something which isn't new yet, but bear with me for a bit. Uh, the new urban question, I think, really, really began to come into its full glory horror in the 1990s. The new Labour. Something to do with John Major as well. Because if we're thinking about all those items of collective consumption that would seem to be so vital, the question that one could ask, and this is part of the question I wanted to answer, is that if these items are so important for capitalism, so vital in terms of social reproduction, so vital in terms of the reproduction of capitalism as a political, economic, social system, you know, getting people to work on time, making sure if they're sick they get health care. But not, it's not necessarily done altruistically, even though the welfare state was struggled for. It's done for a structural necessity for the development of capitalism. But if that's the case, how can you kind of get away with privatizing them, deregulating them, financializing them, and still the system reproduces itself? And it's done it in a way which is, is less draconian than Margaret Thatcher. It's done it in a very subtle way, and it's done it through various media. Uh, one media would be the public finance initiatives, the PFIs, very interesting initiatives started by John Major in 1992. When Tony Blair was elected, <coughs> last time I voted, I have to say, I can admit that, I suppose, with a certain form of embarrassment, last time I voted was for Tony Blair in 1997, and then I, and then I left the UK. Uh, <laughs> so I, I escaped all this, thankfully. I, I have to say it wasn't intended, but I'm actually quite happy that I did. But in some way it gave me a position to look back retrospectively to see what the hell was going on. But when Tony Blair was first elected, 
they were dead against PFI. It's one of the things that they said, these things are, are privatization of the public sector. They're <coughs> public-private partnerships without much public participation. There are ways in which infrastructure has been valorized, ports, uh, all forms of local authorities, including pretty much the whole of the NHS right now. Uh, schools become a part of PFIs. These are things that haven't just taken place in the UK either. And from 1992 up until 2013, uh, the figures suggest that the big four accountants have made about a billion pounds in the whole PFI scam since the initiation. How have they done it? Well, the services have been downsized, services have been cut, uh, gyms, schools, sports centres have been cut down, hospitals have closed, we know that. Uh, services haven't been cut completely. There is some kind of public sector. The NHS is still there. I think the interesting thing that's happened is how it's been valorized, how it's been financialized, how what was once an ex, you know, a use value has become an exchange value in very subtle ways. And the mediation of, of the, these deals between the public, as it were, and the private, the, 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 the de facto public and the de facto private, are these anonymous, behind-the-scenes, unaccountable uh, middle managers who prop up the accountancy firms, the big accountancy firms? And if you look at the political complexion of the 1990s, we didn't just see sort of doors revolving between the public and private, between private, uh, private uh, vested interest uh, uh, people and, uh, and the public sector. The doors were spinning around. We saw this secondment. We saw accountants getting seconded into politics. We saw politicians seconded into accountancy. We saw CEOs enter government. We saw the regulator of the tax, David Hartner, enter government. Then David Hartner lets Vodafone off the hook from their taxes. And suddenly David Hartner goes to join Deloitte. Deloitte has one of the major clients, surprise, surprise, Vodafone. And these guys are, you know, they're moving in and out. They're shifting around in ways which nobody knows. Nobody's accountable. Nobody knows which door to knock on. And in, 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 in some ways, the, the, the question is, a, is, a, is, a, is as much Kafkaesque as it is Marxist uh, about how it has been that this middle manager, middle manager class, this, 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 uh, this professional class, seconded class, has mediated between the rentiers and the creditors. Because one thing that's really happened is, and this is one of the answers I would give to how has the urban question come about, what is the new urban question, how is it that you can deregulate, financialize, privatize public services that are so vital for capitalism and get away with it? Well, you can have your, you can have your cake and eat it. You can valorize them themselves as physical, as, physical, as physical products. You can throw them on the stock market. You can make a killing. You know, 750 million, I think, was made the first day of the, the privatization of the Royal Mail. Uh, and you can get every, everybody else the ordinary stiff, i.e. us, to cough up the money ourselves for education, for health, and for housing. We privatize the housing, the private rental market now is doing gloriously. So we've got this system now where those, as it were, we can see the rentiers, the 1%, if we can use the shorthand, have valorized, uh, dispossessed isn't quite right, I don't think. In this instance, the, the question of dis accumulation by dispossession isn't right in that, in that sense. It's been a little bit more subtle than that, but they've valorized the old public services, the old collective consumption that Manuel Castell spoke about, and the whole debt economy, the, ra the rise of, of household debt around those issues of collective consumption. The fact is that we have coughed up ourselves to self-reproduce, as it were, to pay up money for ourselves with a burgeoning debt economy. Bank of England, November 2013, Household debt in UK now, 1.43 trillion pounds, highest it's ever been. So that's one way in which that odd conundrum about how can you square the public sector being run down at the same time capitalism still survives. It doesn't grow, it survives. And it's been an extractive process dominated by rentiers, land rent, an aristocratic class, and creditor class, and a whole series of middle managements that mediate in between and enter both those flanks in some shape or form. And all of that, I think, never really gets mentioned in the triumphalist or the professional discourse. 
So my book dispels was my entry point. I'm probably talking too long because that's kind of my preface for what I want to say. Because the stuff I want to talk about, I think, is how does that actually affect the dynamics of the urban process? How has that affected the urbanization process? One way it has affected the urban process is something that I'm calling uh, the practice of neo-Osmanization. Now, Osmanization, of course, was something that happened in Second Empire Paris. Uh, David's written a lot about it, very beautifully, I have to say. Uh, were Baron Hausmann, and Baron Hausmann was not Baron, but he called himself that. I think that actually sets the tone a little bit about his ego as a master builder. Uh, said about tra the tra whole transformation of central Paris. I, I suspect it's pretty much known to the, the audience here about what went on as a as a prototypical form of gerrymandering, altering the physical environment, uh, valorizing the land, gentrifying the, the land rents went up, and this process whereby the popular classes located centrally were actually in some way shifted out to the periphery. And of course, in Paris, it's, the majority of them went up to the northeast, neighborhoods like Belleville, and that set the tone of a process of divide and rule, of subtle gerrymandering, it altered the whole political geography of, of Paris, the arrondissement system did so, the voting, the different communes, the different town halls in Paris, the whole physical complexion of Paris was altered in a way that altered the economic and political complexion too. What I wanted to get in now to try and convey is how that process is now neo. And I think the neo is significant. Because it's not just something that's happening to one city in that way. It's happening to all cities pretty much everywhere. And, and one way that that could be conceptualized is doing something that Henri Lefebvre himself does in, in a book like The Urban Revolution, when he suggests that let's stop talking about cities and let's talk about urban society instead. And he has these, these typically slippery terms when he says that the city you know, is a, is a pseudo-concept, one word he uses. He says that urban society is, is, is predicated on the ruins of the city, which is quite an enigmatic uh, idea as well. What he's basically saying is that urban society is much more diffusive. It's those centers and peripheries, those cores and, 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 and outlying areas, Bonlieu, if you want to call it that, are in much more of a dynamic type of, of tension. And it is a contradiction, and it is a moving contradiction as well, uh, to use David's, David's terminology from his new book. It's a moving contradiction that, that, that changes in particular eras, in particular contexts. And this moving contradiction then implies that if we were to imagine the whole of the globe as urban fabric, as urban society somehow enveloping us all in some shape or form. And here I'm not just talking about bricks and mortar and big buildings, I'm just talking about the, the, the remit of, of urban society, the impact on cities as a way of life, to use Lewis <coughs> Worth's term, and how it impacts on all of us. That if we were to enter that fabric, maybe as the way in which uh, a quantum theorist would enter it, looking at the molecular structure of this fabric, of course, this is not something very small, this is something incredibly vast. But what we would see is a, is a, similar, kind of, a similar kind of setup going on inside. We'd see this oscillation between a core and periphery, between a wave and a particle, between a process and a place, between a core that actually stakes out its own turf, and in doing so, it needs to actually create its own periphery. To the degree that the periphery now is, is, is the bulk of people. Hence, the 99%, I think, is a very nice term to put it in a, in a, in a short-term way. The 1% somehow is colonizing the core, valorizing the core, revalorizing the core. It occasionally uses draconian methods like land grabs. It uses displacement, which can be quite autocratic, involve violence, and it often does in, in, in other parts of the world, in Latin America, in, in China, Latin America, and Sub-Saharan Africa, it, it actually tends to involve a lot of rural land. But in places like China, the land grabs are, 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 are viciously done. It can also be done through eminent domain, which is a, a neat strategy that lots of Amer in a lot of American cities, whereby public land is sequestered by the state. And 
I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to be nostalgic, but I think in the past uh, that land often went towards building some form of public infrastructure. I think now it goes to being sold pretty much at, at knockdown prices to private investors to redevelop that land in some shape or form. And often the, the, the developments stay empty for many, 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 many years because it, they're being done speculative. So it's all about uh, land grabs, and this is what I would see as being part of neo Osmanization. In its perhaps more um, dominant form, it doesn't involve violence at all. It just involves everything that the triumphalists think are great. And uh, here we would, we would include Boris Johnson. Rising property prices. <laughs> this is a success, you know. This is what the pro professionals and the, and the triumphalists want. And that rising property prices, the, the normal operation of a land market, and the creation of scarcity, and, and, and in some ways the expropriation of class monopoly rent leads to a form of neo osmanization It displaces. In the book, I talk a bit about that. Uh, what interests me probably more, I think, is what goes on in the periphery. What is the periphery? What is the constituency in the periphery? If there's going to be any, any, any revolutionary change, then it's clear that the protagonist, that the, the constituency, is going to be a, the kind of ragged masses that are in some shape or form feeling being uh, on the receiving end of neo osmanization People who are displaced. This is a big constituency. It's people who are now not only the, pre the precariat in work, but the precariat in the housing market, a lot of those. It's people who are, have seen their houses repossessed, uh, a lot of those in the US, a lot of those in the UK too. It's people who are very young, who leave university and have, have huge debts and don't know what to do and they can't get jobs. The ninja generation, no income, no jobs, no assets. It's older people, probably about my age, because I'm pretty much fucked, without a pension, uh, essentially. It's a constituency which is ragged, homogeneous, disparate, unorganized, and yet, it's a mass of people, the popular masses, that is waiting in the wings and is on the receiving end of this process, this multifaceted process whereby things are being extracted at their expense. In the book, I decided what's a good way to think about what this process is. And I started to think, you know, in 1780, 1789, 1788, there was a bunch of aristocrats who were living off landed property, living off interest, interest payments. They were, living, they were living off essentially unearned income. That's, that's the point. Living off unearned income. The vast majority of people, the popular masses, as the French like to say, were the so-called sans-culottes. And the sans-culottes, those without knee breeches, really were a group of people that didn't necessarily have class consciousness. They were the urban popular masses. They were the journeymen and jenny women, they were the small artisans, the small business owners, the day laborers. It was it was a it was a, a fairly ragged bunch of people in some Cuba. But essentially they were urban whose animosity toward the aristocrats, which is how my imagination works, right? <laughs> was completely predicated on the fact that the aristocrats possessed and appropriated unearned income. Because these guys in the Son Culotte worked extremely hard, often having more than one job. So then I thought, well, what went on? Because in a strange way, if you look at, if you look at the history of the French Revolution, it's, it's surprising how quickly it happened. You know, if only the Bastille could be knocked down. Occupied Wall Street tried that, but it doesn't work in that way anymore. It's quite clear. You can't, you can't storm Wall Street and expect the whole financial system to collapse. You know, the, World, the World Trade Center did fall down, but it was that World Trade for probably more than two hours. So it doesn't quite work that way. So the way in which the tactics would, would, would work, perhaps, are maybe just, just, just more subtle. The more, the, the, they need, the, the sun lot needed some way to be organized, and what happened was there was a bunch of, uh, of, of progressive bourgeois who started Jacobin clubs, 
Jacobin clubs were meeting halls where one debated certain things. Uh, it happened quite quickly once the euphoria took place. Perhaps I'm being naive and idealistic, but I think that there is a big, big constituency out there that is doing all kinds of things. It's shifting to the right, shifting to the left. The youth should be on the streets, according to Lapovitsis and The Guardian yesterday in Greece. The Greek contingent is that there's a lot of sonkyu love there, I think. In fact, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot, there's a lot of Greeks in, in, in a contemporary climate that act a bit like the aristocrats 3,000 3, years ago. You know, they didn't work. They spoke about politics and the agora, which is pretty much what they do now. But of course, it's not the aristocrats that are doing that. It's the people who are the sonkyu love. And they're doing it in the agoras of, of, of many cities, that, and we've seen it with the rise of Occupy. The issue then becomes, what kind of politics can, can, come, out of, can come out of this? And in the, in the New Urban Question, I just start to play around with the idea that maybe there is some way in which the Song Culot can organize itself. Organize itself, it needs some form of forum to do that. It needs some kind of public space. It needs some way in which it can be organized. It needs some way in which it can come about uh, organized of the insurrection. And to think about that, it, it's almost trying to resolve a simultaneous equation, because simultaneous equations are trying to resolve two unknowns. So if you think about the insurrection somehow transforming the, the structures of power that we have now, the whole administration, the whole, the whole physical and, and ideological, economic, cultural fabric of, of global capitalism, that it needs to be somehow um, attacked in, in, in some way, uh, in some shape or form, that, that the sans culotte and the public, the public spaces that we have can begin to then raise these issues about what this system is about. And the kind of spaces and protagonists that we can see occupying in these in, the, in, the, in, this, in this very ragged group of people called the Song Culotte, are people who then need to organize themselves after the insurrection. And here's who I think things like the right to the city and the Bill of Rights went better in a, in a, in a post-insurrectional scenario. So then I started to talk about, look about revolutionary history, but revolutionary history that somehow is projected into the, into the present. And looking at questions of organization that were done by people like Blonky. And actually it's true, Blonky was a professional revolutionary, because David asked me earlier, he said, when I was I was dissing the professionals, what about professional revolutionaries? I think they're different. They're not on anybody's payroll to begin with. Not on many people's payroll, I suppose. Maybe they are on people's payroll. Rousseau was, you know, he kind of cozy up to the aristocrats to get keep him keep him in to keep him in stuff. But in general they're not they're not on the payroll. But people like Blanqui was a professional organizer. And I think if you look around today, there are plenty of, of, of people who are doing this, 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 this organizing. If you want to call them professional organizers, they will. Because they have nothing to lose. I suspect there's a lot of what I call in the book secret agents who are hanging out in Greece because they have nothing to lose. Their life now becomes one of organization. It may not necessarily be organizing on the left, <laughs> I have to say, too. But nonetheless, there's a sense in which there were, there's, there were questions of organizing this, the popular masses. There's also a category that I call double agents, I should say. The double agents are people who have to disguise what they do in some pragmatic, in, in some pragmatic way. So they do their job and they think, you know, what the hell, but really you know, the, the whole value system, that deep down feeling about what is right, uh, is a very different proposition. So they secretly plot. Yes. Frederick Engels is a classic double agent. If you think about you know, the, the, the owner of a textile mill in Manchester, yeah, a guy who was planning to overthrow that same system. You know. I spoke a, a, a few days ago, I was talking in, uh, in Hackney, and I was just saying that radical publishers, bless, bless, bless their hearts, are kind of double agents too. That you see, in a way, it's, it's, it's different from being on the payroll, I think. It's different because it involves a certain independence of thought, a certain independence of organizing, a certain strategy, a certain counter-ideology that takes place. 
And it's something that is actually probably constitutes the, the bulk of the 99%. And it just needs some way in which they can connect with other secret agents. I think there's another category of people too who we could call the, the great escapers. Now, the great escapers in a negri and hard sense are those who are a little bit more you don't like Negri and Hart? Now you're doing this now, aren't you, Dr. Strange? I'm sorry, I'm joking. <laughs> the great escapers are those who are in some way con they, they they can see something which is positive. You know, it's positive. It's about how to exit the capitalist system. How to conceive a, a number that can that can invent another form of life now. And here I'm thinking of you know, people like the folks in uh, in Tarnak, the authors of the Coming Insurrection, who, who talk about the the, the the great escape. And it's a, it, it's a way in which fighting is implicated in flight, in being a bit nomad, in being also rather clan, clandestine. Because I think clandestinity is quite important in the, in this form of organising. Because it, it becomes almost a mirror image of the middle managers and the obfuscations that they do. And I think that the, the kind of organizing that can go on behind the scenes, and I, I know that the Tarnak 9 really did actually unnerve the Sarkozy state in 2007 when they came up with, with the, the coming insurrection. But they also ran, ran the village of Tarnak in a Limousin in, in, in France. And so they would be an example of the great escapers. Anybody that organizes squats, that reappropriates any space, tries to live in a more communal life, tries to in some way live out some of the 17 points that David makes about ideas of political, political practice, now and opts out. It's not just opting out, it's oppositional because it knows what it's opting out to do. And it knows what's going to happen when it does try to opt out. And now we, I think we also need another category, another constituency, that are in the, the, the song culot, and we could call these the, the great refusers. And the great refusers are the people who don't think about critical posit positivity, but they think about critical negativity. They're negative, they say no, it's the great refusal. Enough is enough, I prefer not to. I'm not gonna take this shit anymore. The great refusal in the Herbert Marcuse sense from one dimensional, one dimensional man, it's also Nina Powers, one dimensional woman too here. The great refusal. No, the power to refuse. There's another category that I play around with, and I'm playing around with this in a, in a way which is existing now, which is metaphorical, but also it's a little bit normative and a bit of wishful thinking too, which isn't necessarily such a bad thing. But there's another category that I talk about, and this is a category that Henri Lefebvre uses in, in his introduction to modernity. And he talks about you think the parasites was bad? He talks about the maggots in the apple. And that's us, by the way. We're the maggots in the apple who reside in the core, or near the core, after being displaced. And we're trying to eat our way out of this rotten apple. And if anybody looks at the introduction to modernity, it's the last, it's, it's the last chapter, the 12th prelude of the introduction to modernity. And he talks about a new group of people, essentially young people, people and if you read his descriptions, sound a little bit like the kind of people we have today if you fast forward things, so, you know, 150 years. Because to use that metaphor, he's talking about Stendhal, the, the French novelist from the mid-1850s. It makes very interesting reading about the potentiality of a new romanticism. And this is something I like. Because I wish we could find some new romanticism. And if we are going to get a catalytic concept here, which is what David's talking about, I, I'm not sure it's alienation is quite the right one, if I can refer to the book. I don't know what it is. There may not be a catalyzing conception, catalytic conception. But I, I guess I'd much prefer to see things like subversion, imagination. Outrage would be another one, you know, Stefan Hessel. Time to get outraged, you know. Because in some ways we should be outraged about things. Even thinking about a new value system too. And, and here I'm in total agreement with David. He, he'll probably have something to disagree with here, but I tend not to disagree too much with what he's saying. Other than the fact I don't think alienation is the right thing that's going to stir people up. Because if people are alienated, I just, I, you know, I just don't think they're going to be responsive. Uh, I don't think people are alienated. Maybe I'm wrong. 
I think people are in some way just completely just disenfranchised. They know what's going on. They just don't know what to do about it. I don't know what to do about it, but I don't think alienation is quite right. And I don't think the obfuscations that they have now with this, this middle management managerialism that in some way conditions our life is a form of alienation. It's a form of dispossession, so, sure. It's a form of disenfranchisement, absolutely. It's a form of hopelessness with some people, yes. It's, it, it's a belief that actually what, what the dogma and the, and the media booms out to them, that there is no alternative. And I don't really believe, I don't believe that, and I don't think other people believe it. And there's a great quote from Oscar Wilde, which is, goes something like, you know, the, Oscar Wilde says something like, you know, a cynic is, a cynic is somebody who knows the price of everything, but the value of nothing. And I just think there's a lot of people who know the prices of stuff, and it's an interesting thing to think about Marxist theory of value vis-a-vis -vis the classical economics. But in general, they know the price of everything. They tot it up all the time. Maybe we can think about in inventing a new value system, a new system of value, a new notion of value, which is not about exchange, but it's something about use. And my final, my final point would be that there's an odd sense in which Manuel Castells, much as a lot of the book is dated of the urban question, I think he was totally right. Uh, I think he was totally right about a couple of things. I think, that, I think he was right about collective consumption. But I don't think he was right about collective consumption as an analytical category. He was right about collective consumption as a normative desire. That's what we ought to have in the city. It's not an analytical entry point. It's what we need to have, a new kind of collective consumption, a new form of commons, a new way in which we can begin to think about organizing the city as a, as, as, as a kind of use value. And also to reiterate Henri Lefebvre, ironically enough, in the end, the city was never anywhere where things got produced anyway. It was never a productive place. It was always a place where people hung out. There were some little market exchanges. It was always a place of consumption. And it was also a place of festival. It was a commons. It was a place where human people did get reproduced, but they didn't get reproduced as, as labor power. They got reproduced in a, in, a, in a much more communal, in a much more uh, humane way. And so, in the end, the urban question for me would be, just to, running beyond the urban question, the new urban question really, is to think about what a new form of collective consumption might, might actually look like. And that's where I will absolutely say no more. Thank you. Factories of China. 
the uh, profit margins of the direct producers in China, and I'm not talking about the workers, um, whose wages, of course, are extremely low. I'm talking about the capitalists who run those factories. Uh, their profit margins are very low. Uh, in large part because what they make uh, flows to the United States and then they're marketed by merchant capitalists, not by producers. And it's the merchant capitalists that make the money. And it's no accident that once upon a time in the United States, the big companies uh, which we looked at as being central to what the US economy was about, uh, like General Motors, so what was good for General Motors was good for the United States. Uh, General Motors is no longer the most significant company in the United States. Walmart is. So there's been a shift of power from production capital to merchant capital. The merchant capitalists, and this will also include Apple and others like that, are making most of their money through the realization of value produced in China by marketing their goods in the United States. Uh, this is a transfer of value through the circulation process. It's a classic form of uh, kind of imperialist structures of ex value extraction and, and, and transfer. But when we start to look at this and say, well, what is it that Walmart is selling and why and uh, to whom? Then, of course, you immediately find yourself uh, looking at practices of consumption. Now, there's a tendency to say, well, of course, consumption is unproductive. But if you look at the contradictory unity between production and consumption, that would be a wrong way to look at it. Because if there's no consumption, there's no value. Marx is very clear about this in Capital. He said, if there's no desire for commodity, no market for commodity, then the labor incorporated and congealed in the commodity is valueless. So that actually the circulation of capital depends as much upon processes of realization as it does depend upon processes of production. And you cannot therefore weight it in some way and say, this is more important than that. In Marx's theory, by and large, the tendency has always been to emphasize production and reduce consumption to something else. There's no theory of consumerism in Marx. There's no theory of urbanization and consumerism in Marx. Uh, because Marx, in volume one of Capital, focuses purely on production and doesn't say anything at all about consumption. Consumption is the topic of volume two. Volume two is such a boring book that nobody reads it. <laughs> and the result of that is they really don't understand Marx's concept of Capital, which is a contradictory unity between what's going on in volume one and volume two. And when you get into volume two and you start to look at what is being talked about, uh, then you see that actually it's very easy to project most of that into practices and processes of urbanization. And you see immediately the role that urbanization plays in relationship to the dynamics of capital accumulation. This then raises the issue. Uh, in what ways would we therefore say that the city is parasitic and what's going on in the city is parasitic? I actually like the concept, you know, I mean, in New York I like to talk about you know, all the parasitic uh, characters that are, are hanging around in the place, and uh, that's fine, you know, it's a good political point. But analytically, let's take a step back and ask, how, how does this really work? Does this really work well? First off, I disagree with Andy saying that cities always have been about consumption. No, cities have often been about production. And it's still the case that a lot of value is produced in the city. For example, uh, begin with construction. Construction is the production of value. Marx actually argues that transportation is production of value. There's a lot of transportation going on in the city. And this includes truck drivers, includes taxi drivers. I, I mean, you can just go through this and you see a tremendous amount of productive activity going on in the city. And this productive activity is important to co focus upon because one of the things that an insurrectionary movement might do is to start to think about how to organize that particular productive activity that can bring the city to a halt. 
before the truck drivers in the city decided that they would join a union and decide to go on strike, uh, the city would be actually, this is a tremendous source of actually political economic power, which resides at the point of production, not at the point of consumption. So there's a lot of productive activity. And this also, of course, says, well, there are certain cities which are still concentrating on production. You go to Chinese cities, or you look at Dakar and Bangladesh, and these are still centers of productive activity. But it certainly is true that in New York City, we used to have far more in the way of uh, uh, clothing manufacture, textile activity, and all the rest of it. Much of that has been deindustrialized. Many American cities like Detroit and Baltimore have been deindustrialized. The same true like Sheffield and, 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 and Manchester in and, and, and this country. So yes, uh, the balance between certain kinds of production and city locations here has, has shifted. But now I would argue something about the realization process. That if the value cannot be realized, uh, through urbanization, then capital is in a lot of difficulty. So I don't think it's quite right to say that somehow or other all of this activity which is going on around consumerism and consumption and so on is, quote, unproductive because it is absolutely a condition of the circulation of capital that a market be found. And therefore, the city, as, it's an, as it becomes an organized and orchestrated marketplace, and the manner of its orchestration of that consumption becomes absolutely crucial to the circulation of capital in aggregate. And I want, if you like, to recognize that in the formulation, and to recognize that, in, in addition, there are uh, many elements of that, that consumption activity that contain elements of uh, production. And here I think we have to actually then start to bend a little bit to our notion of what, the relation, what that relationship is. There is a concept which was first advanced by Alvin Toffler, that of prosumer. That is, the producer who is simultaneously a consumer. And ask the question, how much consumption is actually at the same time uh, production? And in what ways is capitalist technology now actually merging the two? Uh, you take uh, questions of transportation, I mentioned delivery and all the rest of it. Well, some of us, we go out and we travel and we get the commodity, we bring it home and we cook it. Well, actually, in terms of Marx's accounting, that's very productive activity, except that we're doing it as consumers, not relying on some firm uh, to do it. This uh, can carry over into, I think, some very interesting possibilities and relations. Because when the technologies which are now arising, we find many of the consumption activities are actually being kind of automated and uh, in, uh, structured in such a way uh, that urban life is around the fact that we have to do much of the kind of production. There is a shift, if you like. A lot of activities actually subcontracted to us. Uh, for, instance, for instance, my favorite argument here is when you check yourself in at the airport, who does the checking in? It used to be somebody else checks you in, now you check yourself in. You now check yourself out of supermarkets, you now do a lot of things that, that actually, so the, 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 the lifestyle question uh, connected to urbanization is becoming uh, rather, rather more important. And connected to that, is also the question of where does the productive labor begin and end uh, in relationship to divisions of labor. There's been a lot of argument, of course, about household production and what to say about that. But I think we need to go even further than that and recognize that uh, when you start to look at subcontracting and divisions of labor and, and all the rest of it, the idea of where productive activity begins and where it ends starts to become very fuzzy, very fuzzy indeed. And there's a whole realm of thinking now, which is actually uh, sort of a derivative of the hard and negri kind of uh, arguments about, uh, uh, about collective labor. 
And it's also about the general intellect. <coughs> and what the general intellect is about is the actual production of new knowledges and new structures of understanding, which then become embedded, if you like, in, particularly in the infrastructures. Now Marx talked about the general intellect in the Grundrisse, and when he did so, he was effectively talking about the way in which knowledge gets embedded in machines, in particular in physical infrastructures. And he uses the example of fixed capital. He says fixed capital is actually a manifestation of the general intellect. And in this instance, the, the laborer is no longer doing any productive activity. They're simply there, standing beside what the general intellect is doing. So there's a new, if we talk about new value forms, there's an argument going on right now which we have to address which is in what ways are new value forms actually being constructed through these revolutionary transformations of urban life. So is it possible to actually use the techniques which, which capital is producing right now in an anti-capitalist way, or to what degree do those techniques actually define a form of opposition which actually is, is, is going to replicate uh, much of the, 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 the nature of the capital accumulation process which we are trying to battle against? So these are, if you like, critical reflections which need to be made. And I'm, I'm, I'm posing this as, as, as questions that I don't have clear answers to. Uh, but I think that uh, when we start to look at the urban and what is happening within the urban, um, this is one of the doubts I would, I, I would, I would have uh, about uh, the formulation that we should actually be thinking about collective forms of consumption. That's a nice idea, in a way, as a normative. Uh, kind of proposal, particularly if it's uh, around the notions of the commons, and I would be broadly supportive of that. But then I think we ought to also be careful and have a, a, a different, maybe a, a slightly different perspective on, on, on what the opposition might need to look like in order to launch a very uh, strong anti-capitalist dynamic. Uh, which leads me, if you like, to the final point, which is I think that a lot of opposition these days does not actually want to analyze what capital is about. Uh, it's very interesting. I mean, uh, I get accused of being capitalocentric because I like to talk about capital <laughs> accumulation. And I get people say, you're capitalocentric, I don't want to listen to you. And you kind of go, well, if you don't understand what capital is doing, how can you possibly contest it? But there's a kind of sense uh, that people have that if you understand what capital is doing, you'll get so overwhelmed, you'll become powerless. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, my point is, no, you can gain a great deal of power from getting a proper understanding of what capital is doing, because then you know what it is it has to be changed and how it can be changed. And the reason I was laid out, tried to lay out those 17 contradictions in the book that I wrote was to try to articulate exactly what, what uh, those, those kinds of uh, issues might, uh, might be. So these are some unfriendly comments that I'm not going to get. What's your name? I not get any worse. I'm quite, quite nice. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that there are... That's worse for me, David. Yeah. Yeah. You might be ready for that. Anyway, so I'll leave it there. Thank you.